All right, my eighth how to play Blue Water Navy video, and ironically, uh, every how to play video I make has some mistakes in it about how to play that I have to correct. But we're looking to learn the game, and if we learn by making mistakes and learning from them, I'm okay with that. I hope you are. Now, here's a mistake that I made two videos ago that I need to clear up. This was a Soviet submarine attack against the American task force. The victor here has just moved into the zone and it's firing torpedoes at the U.S. task force. And um, these were the roles that the victor made. I erroneously claimed that the victor scored no hits. That was a mistake. Here is the submarine versus task force attack table. A roll of a six it says it's a hit and that T there means that, and it says this in the rules farther down, if the submarine in question has the T modifier on it that, and is using super heavy torpedoes, then it gets to treat that six as if it was a seven. The difference between a six and a seven is this. A six can hit an escort ship uh, that does not have prairie masker technology. A uh, seven to nine can hit either an escort ship with or without Prairie Master technology, or it can hit an amphibious unit or a convoy. And so the six that was rolled should have been a hit that could be allocated to an escort that does not have the Prairie Master technology. And we will notice here the U.S. has two escorts. U.S. one has the P icon, and so it does have Prairie Master, but U.S. seven does not. So I should have claimed that was a hit against the task force that the task force had to defend itself against. Another mistake I made was believing that there were no hits. I still allowed the U.S. task force to fire back at the victor, and that was a mistake. If a submarine attempts a torpedo attack against a task force and fails to make a hit, the task force does not counterattack. And what this is representing, as I understand it, is this isn't uh, a simulation where you're the captain of a submarine and you're firing a torpedo and seeing if it hits. What's happening here in the course of this action that the Soviets are taking is their Victor 1 submarine is trying to maneuver into position to find and prosecute an attack against U.S. ships in the sea zone. And for whatever reason, it's not able to launch an attack. It may uh, it may have an inadequate crew or skipper that can't get the job done. Uh, the U.S. defenses may be too effective. There may be a breakdown on the Soviet submarine, or they may simply not find the task force. But for whatever reason, uh, they're not able to launch an attack. And so because they don't launch an attack, the American task force either doesn't know they're there or doesn't know they're there with enough precision to counterattack. Once torpedoes get in the water, the Americans certainly know where the torpedoes are coming from, and then they're going vigorously on the counterattack. So everything played out as it should in this log. Uh, the task force rolled a successful defense against the hit and also damaged the victor. So those results ended up as they should have been, but the procedure I followed to get them was incorrect, and that uh, that's very relevant. Uh, that's going to come up a lot in the game, whether your submarine hits or doesn't hit. Now, the second mistake I made was during the ship's event, and this is also, uh, this is important. In the ship's event, the first step is movement of task forces. If the task forces choose not to move, they can initiate anti-submarine warfare, or they can initiate an amphibious landing. If they do either of those two things, uh, they are going to be seen most likely. When you initiate an amphibious landing, you uh, grant the opponent a free detection roll. And if the whatever status your task force is in when it begins, uh, it could be upgraded, right? You could go from no detection to poor. You could go from poor to good. That all happens in step one of the ship's event. Step two of the ship's event tells you to degrade any detection that was not present during step one. The way that works with an amphibious landing attempt is this. The, the amphibious landing task force can never be degraded, can never have its detection level degraded in step two of the landing procedure. It can end up upgraded in step one, but no matter what happens in step one, the amphibious task force does not get degraded. 
the way that I played the log out, I had the Soviet task force drop from good detection to poor detection, and then the American task force detected it, so they ended up the way they should be, but again, the procedures I followed to get there were incorrect. Okay, I hope that that all makes sense. Those are important considerations. Now, it is a Soviet action, and I'm going to go ahead and start a log here, and I'm also going to be paging through a log that I started earlier with a failed recording attempt. The Soviets are going to launch a surface-to-surface -surface missile attack against the American task force. And there's a lot going on with this, so I'm going to actually refer directly to the rules while we talk about it. Uh, upper left, 17.14 surface ship launch missiles. Soviet surface units with black or yellow missiles represent long-range anti-ship missiles like the Shipwreck, which are yellow, and the Sandbox, which are black. They may be fired at a good detected task force in the same zone as a Soviet task force, and they do that without needing to make a roll. If there is a task force in the same zone as the Soviet task force that is poor detected, the Soviets, if they have a fast task force, can attempt to attack it by rolling a six or higher on a single die. <clears throat> if the Soviet task force is slow, it cannot attack a poor detected task force with missiles. Uh, if it's fast, it can attempt to. If it attempts to make the attack and fails the roll, the operations point is still expended. Okay, so let's take a look back at the <clears throat> Soviet task force and see what they've got for missiles. The upper right of the counter indicates the number and type of anti-ship missiles. So the Kirov has two yellow anti-ship missiles, the Cresta has seven white, the Kinda has two black, and going on down the line. Um, the Udaloy also has that red three. So the red three is a special kind of missile that is played um, through cards, and the white missiles we're going to get to in a minute. They're not going to be part of this attack. So the Soviets have three black and two yellow uh, ship-fired surface-to-surface missiles that they may bring to bear against NATO. Um, we're going to go skip down a paragraph and come to here where it talks about white, blue, and red missiles. They can only be used through the play of cards, which is part of the campaign game, unless the combat is happening in the Baltic Sea. The Baltic Sea is a more confined area, <clears throat> and uh, in the Baltic Sea, a surface unit can fire its white or red missiles at a good task force in the same zone, um, but only a single unit may fire from each attacking task force. Uh, and then it says separate task forces cannot coordinate fire. None of that applies to what we're doing here, but it does matter. So now we're going to go back to the procedure. So the Soviets are launching their missiles. Remember, we have five missiles, two yellow and three black. If the target task force has uh, F-14 fighters within it, those fighters roll to try to shoot down the missiles. If the task force that's firing has a poor detection, the F-14 fighters roll a single die, and if the task force has good detection, they roll two dice. However many dice they roll, if they roll a one, it kills one missile. If they roll a two, it kills two missiles. So if they roll double twos, it's going to shoot down four of the incoming missiles. And NATO player selects which type of missiles were just shot down. That is relevant because some missiles are better than others. So we're going to go back to the log, and we're going to see what happens here. Uh, that's the Tomcats roll, and they do in fact roll double twos, so they shoot down four of the five missiles. Um, and they are going to select the two yellow missiles, because those are harder to kill, and two of the black missiles. So one black missile remains inbound against the task force. I want to just point another thing out. The F-14 fighters can only make this defense if their individual task force is being attacked. If there's another task force in the zone that does not have F-14s, it's not, sim it's not the same procedure as when there's combat air patrol and they fight against any fighter. Okay? I hope that's clear. So, Soviets have one uh, missile remaining, and if you refer to the player aid card, missile attacks against task forces, if there is between one and five missiles coming in, the the target task force is allowed to allocate one more SAM than the number of missiles. So the NATO player can allocate at most two SAMs to the defense. The US-3 unit has five SAMs, so they can handle that no problem. They're going to take shots with two SAMs, and they're going to fire, and they get a four and a four, and each four is one hit, so the Soviet missiles 
are uh, knocked down. And so what I thought was going to be a devastating attack by the Soviets turned out not to be so bad, right? Okay. Uh, but there are still reasons why that task force being where it is is a bad idea, which are going to be upcoming in a moment. Another important thing to know is that when ships fire their surface-to-surface uh, -surface missiles, they those missiles are depleted. And so there's a marker that comes with the game. I'm not going to search for it and make you watch me do that. But each ship that just fires should be marked as having fired its missiles. And they can't then make another attack later. Okay? So... Now it is, uh, I've got to go ahead and take the operations point off for the Soviets. Now the U.S. is going to attack the task force. Uh, now the U.S., boy, would it love to send uh, a massive airstrike against the Soviets, right? Because uh, that's the best chance they have of hitting the convoys. However, for more than a single unit to participate in an airstrike at the same time, one of two things must happen. All of the units must be part of the same land facility base, or all of the units must come from carriers in the same sea zone. So by splitting up their task forces here, NATO cut in half the striking power it could send against the Soviets at any one time. So they're going to have to piecemeal this, and since we haven't gotten to use them yet, let's send the British. Let's get them into the fight. Here are some Buccaneer strike aircraft. They're going to fly up here because their base is finally repaired. They've been itching for a fight, and they're finally going to get it. The Soviet fighters have been shot down previously, so we don't need to worry about those fighters. And uh, we're just going to go quickly through this procedure. Uh, the Soviets have uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten SAM points in this task force, so they're going to be able to defend against the incoming six anti-ship missiles by firing eight SAMs at them. And so here are the eight rolls, and when firing at NATO missiles, there is a minus one die roll. So six missiles flying at this task force, eight SAMs coming up to defend, six and eight. And let's look at this result here. Minus one to each of these um, takes it down to the three becomes a two and misses, every other roll hits, and so there are more than six hits, and so the strike unit failed to do its job. But it probably wasn't its fault, it's probably more the fault of faulty command uh, units. Okay, so boom, NATO's operation point goes down, the Soviets get to take their last action, and um, what are we going to try to do here? Well, the Soviets don't have a lot left, do they? So what they're going to do is they're going to go ahead and they're going to decide, should they try to use this Foxtrot before it gets totally wiped off the board? Or should they try to get this healthy Foxtrot into the fight? And I think we're going to go ahead and get the healthy Foxtrot into the fight. They're going to move down here and take a shot at the American task force. Uh, the Foxtrot would normally roll four dice, plus one for the target task force having a good detection on it. However, this is a diesel sub attacking a, task, a fast task force, so it loses two die. So the five attack dice drop down to three attack dice, which is still a pretty good number. Here we go. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I've never done that before. Yeah, oh yes, I did once in a solo game. All right, so that's uh, three tens. That <laughs> the task force better be Johnny on the spot with its defense here. Okay, so uh, those natural tens are all hits that can be made against capital ships. So the carrier is in trouble if the task force can't fend these off. So anti-submarine points. We have two, four, six for the sturgeon, and four for the US three makes ten, and two for the carrier makes. 12, and that means normally three die with a plus one modifier, but this is a fast task force defending itself, and so that drops down a column, and they're going to roll three dice trying to uh, <laughs> roll three eights here to get rid of those three tens. Oh, boom, they get one, and only one of those tens removed. So now we're going to get to see the capital hit damage procedure, capital ship damage procedure, that um, we talked about previously played out in real time, which is good. It'd be good to see that happen. So, 
two natural tens. And so now we go to the um, the capital ship damage table on the player aid, the task forces detection missile attacks player aid. And we look at the situation that, you know what, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to scroll a little bit here. I'm going to try to find this in the rules so that we can look at it together instead of me just reading it out. Let's see if I can't find it. I think I can. Uh, capital ships, capital ships. Are we there? Yeah, here we go. Okay, capital ship damage. So here's the table that I'm looking at. You have to first determine the number of dice you're going to roll. And so um, none of these apply. It's two Soviet, uh, two are being rolled because it's Soviet torpedo. <clears throat> if the um, if the capital ship was already damaged, you would add a die. It's not, but each additional hit taken at the same time. So there are two hits taken. So we're going to roll two dice for the torpedoes and an additional die for <clears throat> the um, for the second hit. And we're using the huge modifier. So if any of these rolls are a 10, the carrier is sunk outright. Otherwise, it's damaged. And remember what I said. The if no rolls are a 10, even if both of them are hits, there's just a damage. Okay? So here we go. Uh, boom! So, the lowly Soviet Foxtrot diesel sub sneaks into position. I think this happened in a war game once, right? Where a Swedish diesel sub, like, came to the surface, like, you know, 50 yards away from an American carrier or something. So, um... So the Foxtrot has managed to get in real close and lay a couple of torpedoes, bang, bang, right into the American carrier. That's bad news for the U.S. war effort, isn't it? So here we've got the Enterprise, and uh, since the carrier is now going down, these air units are also eliminated. So that was well done. I want to just refer to one other thing. Um, if the carrier had been damaged, here's what would have happened if it had been damaged rather than sunk. Uh, it could not fly strike aircraft. Um, any combat air patrol would receive a negative modifier against airstrikes. And the carrier no longer contributes the plus two to the anti-submarine warfare. And it loses its intrinsic detection capability. So a damaged carrier gets, uh, gets hurt. Um, there's another thing that is important, and I'm going to go find that right here. Um, well, I'm not seeing it here. Um, when, when a car, it's in the rules. I don't know where it is. When a carrier, or when a carrier is damaged, the owning player has damaged, not sunk, has to pick one of the air units that are on the carrier and make a roll to see if that unit is reduced. So if this if the Saratoga had been damaged, the U.S. would have said we're either going to roll for the Tomcats or we're going to roll for the carrier air group. And if we roll a six or higher, they are going to be reduced a step. They're going to be damaged. And But that didn't happen here. Okay. So yeah, the American carrier is no more. And uh, so there you go. That uh, I'll teach you to sail up into the Norwegian Sea, won't it? And so that was uh, an operations point well spent for the Soviets. And uh, the American people are mad. So uh, the U.S. has another operations point. I'm going to finish out this turn here. They're going to get two actions in a row. They're going to launch another attack with an air... They're going to launch another airstrike, and they're going to send uh, the last strike unit that they have. Again, no fighter escort is needed, although they would be free to send one. And so once again, we've got six missiles uh, flying in at the Soviets. Uh, the Soviets are going to be able to fire eight SAMs in defense. Let's see what they get. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So uh, that is one, two, three, four misses, and one, two, three, four hits. So there are two missiles left. Uh, we're rolling on the two missiles table for incoming missile resolution to see what happens. That is a nine. Uh, and because it's good detection, it's actually a modified 10, but that doesn't matter. Uh, so that is two hits. And now we have to see who allocates the hits. We roll two dice. 
and there is a nine and that allows the attacker to allocate the first hit and so we will allocate that hit to the amphibious units because that's our mission here and as we said previously anytime an anti-ship missile hits the amphibious units or convoys it scores two and exactly two hits and so um, that uh, that well that unit needs to be spent I'm, I'm not going to mark it spent because at the end of the turn you remove all well I'm going to do it just because that's how we're supposed to do it right okay boom spent uh, there we go sorry for all this clicking I'm a little bit obsessed about keeping the markers in the order that I like and so it is the next US action and so uh, we've got a couple things we could do we could uh, we could launch a sub and try to do some work with the subs or we could use our maritime patrol aircraft to try to um, take down a Soviet sub. Let's see what Soviet subs remain. That Juliet looks like it could cause problems. Uh, that Echo is not so dangerous. What about down here? This is the Churchill. That doesn't, we're not going to attack, we're not going to friendly fire ourselves. Uh, or then there is this uh, un, undeterred, or, or this unused Foxtrot, but it can't be used. So, um, what do you think? Should we take revenge on this, uh, on this submarine that just just sunk our carrier. Let's see what we can do. All right, here comes the Maritime Patrol aircraft. Uh, sadly, this Maritime Patrol aircraft only fires two dice. This is a Norwegian Orion. I guess they're not as good. It's going to take its dice rolls and a five and a nine. So that is pretty good. That is a hit, and the Foxtrot is not able to make a save. And so the Norwegians have. Uh, sorry, I was shooting it this foxtrot, right? And actually, it doesn't matter, does it? I made a hit, I pick, I now allocate the hit to a target that I'm able to allocate it to, and so I'm going to allocate it to this foxtrot and spend this unit, and that is the end of the turn. So let's go through quickly the end of turn sequence. End of turn, on patrol units may return to base, uh, NATO doesn't currently have any units on patrol. Uh, remove all spent, and you may choose to remove any on patrol marker. Um, uh, and then, oh, so on patrol units may return to base. Return to base all air units if both sides' fighters occupy the same zone. Uh, that's not happening here, but that would be important. So you remove all spent markers. This module has a nice uh, remove spent markers feature. There we go. Um, then the, uh, there's some, some stuff that happens regarding only the campaign game that doesn't matter. And um, but you also have to uh, remove all weather markers. And on the next turn, you would go through weather. So uh, did I finally get through a video doing things right? Uh, I hope so. Um, what I'm going to do in the next video, I'm going to come back and I'm going to do the amphibious landing resolution. I'm just going to skip ahead to that. Any other actions that I would play would just be re repetition of what I've already done. And I'm not trying to win this game or anything. I'm trying to just show you how things work. So I'm going to end this log and we're going to come back and we're going to pretend that it is ship's action time and that we are looking to invade Tron time and we'll see how that goes. All right. Thanks for following along and for your patience with my many mistakes. I will see you again soon.